Good afternoon and welcome to today's Humanities Forum. It's really a pleasure to see all of you here this afternoon. My name is Raymond Hain. I'm the director of the forum, a member of the philosophy department here, and of the humanities program. The Humanities Forum exists to provide a regular space on most Friday afternoons during the semester where the entire campus community can come together to consider some of the deepest human things. Our schedule is organized intentionally around the DWC schedule, and so I suspect that many of you in the room this afternoon are in the process of thinking about our topic this afternoon, Plato. Perhaps you're reading Plato's Republic, perhaps the Symposium, the Phaedrus, the Apology. Uh, it's really a delight to have you all here today to think about this with our distinguished guest. We host a wide range of events, and our schedule, as I said, is integrated into DWC. Today's guest is also integrated into a special seminar. Each semester, the humanities program runs reading seminars for a group of students and faculty and administrators, and the seminar this semester is reading Plato's Laws. It would be difficult to imagine, I think, a more fitting guest for those of us here who want to think more about Plato than Professor John Ferrari, today's distinguished speaker. Professor Ferrari is the Melpanine Distinguished Professor of Classical Languages and Literature at the University of California at Berkeley, where he has taught since 1988. Having grown up in Britain, he received his PhD from Cambridge University and taught for some years at Yale University before moving to Berkeley, where he has taught ancient Greek philosophy, ancient Greek literature and language, and Western civilization in the classics department for over 30 years. He's published widely on Plato, including three books, Listening to the Cicadas, A Study of Plato's Phaedrus, published with Cambridge in 1987, City and Soul in Plato's Republic, published with the University of Chicago in 2005, and The Messages We Send, Social Signals and Storytelling with Oxford University Press in 2017. I'm happy to say that I made extensive use of listening to the Cicadas, his book on Plato's Phaedrus, one summer as I was preparing to teach in our own DWC program. And I warmly recommend it, as well as his other writing, to all of you. In that book, as in all his work on Plato, he shows a remarkable sensitivity to the literary elements of Plato's writing and the delightful complexity of Plato's broader approach to philosophy itself. Plato's work is remarkable for offering every reader something new and precious upon every rereading. And for those of us who find ourselves stung by the Platonic muse, as let's be honest, all of us should be, we would be hard pressed to find a better guide than John Ferrari. His title today is very simply, How to Read Plato. Please join me in welcoming Professor John Ferrari. Thanks very much, Raymond, for that kind introduction. Can everyone hear me at the back? Is this about the volume for the microphone at the back there? Yep, I see hands, uh, heads nodding. That's great. Uh, I'm delighted to uh, be here at Providence College today. Thanks to the uh, speaking to the Humanities Forum, and uh, I'm grateful for the invitation from the Humanities Program, and especially from Raymond Hain. I'm grateful to the weather gods for giving me uh, a wonderful New England fall day uh, to enjoy, as we all have been. I'm extremely grateful to you and deeply impressed, uh, you students, for having showed up in such numbers at 3 o'clock on a Friday afternoon on a beautiful day. Uh, that's, uh, that's, that's moving, and I hope I'll give you something that can stimulate your thought as you continue to read Plato at, the, at this time of the semester. I've been enjoying... Uh, meeting and talking with faculty uh, starting yesterday. It's been, it's been a great, uh, great experience. Today I get to talk with some of the students, some of the undergraduates, uh, I hope, in question time after today's, after, after the lecture that I'm going to give now. All right then, so uh, this title, How to Read Plato, was a title that uh, was proposed to me and I agreed to give the talk under that title, what I'm in fact going to be doing, of course, is telling you how I read Plato. And I'll be giving some reasons why I read Plato the way that I do. 
because it seems to me that there are many different ways, I should acknowledge that there are many different ways to read Plato with, uh, and, and get something worthwhile out of the experience. And I'm going to be arguing that my way of reading Plato's dialogues is one of them. So let me begin from the fact that in his writing, Plato never presents <coughs> philosophic arguments in his own name. Plato never presents philosophic arguments in his own name in his dialogues. He writes dialogues, fictional dialogues, uh, dialogues in which a variety of characters hold a, a philosophic conversation. And the result, in every case, is that Plato, who's a philosopher, is presenting a story. He's a philosopher presenting us with a story. He's not presenting us with a philosophic argument, not directly at least, but a story. And when we interpret a platonic dialogue, these stories that Plato writes, there are two kinds of human behavior for us to make sense of. On the one hand, there's the behavior of the characters within the story, the fictional characters within the story. And on the other hand, there's Plato's behavior as the dialogue's writer, as the story writer. And I'm going to argue that it's important that we keep these two kinds of behavior distinct in our minds when we're constructing our interpretation of the dialogue as a whole. And I'm going to be suggesting to you right now that uh, not everyone does this. So I think it's, uh, so I do want to defend this suggestion for a while before getting to a working it out in an example from a single dialogue. So these two kinds of behavior and keeping them distinct in our minds, the behavior of the fictional characters on the one hand, the behavior of the writer of the story, Plato, on the other hand. What I mean is that, look, it's one thing for us to explain why it makes sense within the fiction, within the fiction, for the character Socrates to have made the argumentative move, whatever it is, that he does. But we should always follow up with the question, why does it make sense for Plato, the writer, to have put his Socrates in a situation where this was the dramatically plausible move for Socrates to have made? The dramatically plausible move for him to have made. Now, sure, at every turn, Socrates, the character within the story, is going to be motivated by the needs of his argument, and also because he's Socrates, he's going to be paying attention to the needs of his conversation partners, something he notably does. He doesn't just, he doesn't just uh, pontificate at them. But Plato, uh, as I read Plato, is motivated by the needs of the story, the needs of the story that those arguments, those turns in the argument, go to constitute. And that, um, why is that? Well, it's because from how the story goes that Plato wants his readers now, his readers, to acquire their sense of what he, Plato, is trying to get across to them. You get, that, you get at what Plato is trying to get across to you. How? By figuring out how the story runs. Uh, which is to say, not just from how the characters in the story behave, happen to behave, but from how Plato, as far as we can figure it out, chooses, consciously chooses, to make the characters in his stories behave. Now, I know you don't just read Plato, you read all sorts of uh, writers in the Western canon and outside of the Western canon, some of them novel writers and poets. Um, so it may seem to you that I'm stating the, stating, restating the obvious about stories here, stories and storytellers. Of course, you, you may be sitting there thinking to yourselves, the author is not uh, working this microphone? Okay. All right. I'm going to do my best Mick Jagger imitation now and kind of consume this microphone. <laughs> I got the mouth for it, you know? I could really... <laughs> so look, I may seem to you to be stating the obvious about storytellers here because, uh, you know, of course the author of a fiction is doing one thing, and the characters in that fiction, who aren't even living human beings, are doing something else. But the reason that I'm restating the obvious, when it comes to Plato, is that uh, the action of a platonic dialogue, most of the time, 
consists in philosophic argument. Philosophic argument is what makes up the bulk of the story, the run of the story. And the fact that this is so has been tempting to scholarly readers of Plato, to, has tempted them to gloss over the distinction, uh, gloss over this distinction that I'm, uh, uh, that I'm emphasizing between the author's behavior and the behavior of the characters within the story. Why? Because it, it's true that the soundness of a philosophic argument is something that you can assess in its own terms without paying attention to the motivations of the person making the argument. And so there's been a tendency among philosophy scholars in particular, uh, perhaps more than among classicists, to home in on what Socrates says, the argument that Socrates is making at any time within the action of the story, rather than considering why he said it, and still less on why Plato had him say it. The tendency has been to treat Socrates as a mouthpiece, a mouthpiece. This is kind of like mouthpiece theory, it's sometimes called. It's a mouthpiece for, for his author. And even if scholars who adopt this approach argue that, uh, acknowledge that Socrates is at times being strategic, taking the needs of his, his conversation partner into uh, account, still ultimately they assume that the basic positions that Socrates shows himself willing to defend, and especially the ones that, he, that crop up in dialogue after dialogue, and he's still willing to uh, defend them repeatedly, those are the positions that Plato meant to adore, endorse. Those are the philosophic arguments that Plato meant to endorse, and he put them straight into Socrates' mouth uh, to, to transmit them to us, the readers. And therefore, this kind of scholar, not me, but this other kind of scholar, Spends, they spend their time mining Socrates' words for, the, for, for, for that, that kind of material. And the thread that they're unraveling by doing so isn't the thread of the story that Plato wrote, but the logical thread of the arguments his character Socrates makes. That's one contrasting way of approaching Plato to the way that I'll be touting for you today. A different manner of treating Socrates that a different group of scholars uh, uses, it does a much better job of attending to story values, uh, to what's sometimes called, they, they, they'll, there's a tendency among these scholars to call it, which is a great phrase, I think, the argument of the action. The argument of the action. And I'm thinking here of scholars for, you know, uh, for those who might know whom I'm talking to, these are scholars in the tradition inaugurated by Leo Strauss. But don't worry if you've never heard of that, uh, that, that person. But on this approach, Socr what Socrates says, even, even the most positive and constructive of the philosophic arguments that Socrates makes uh, in Plato's dialogues, they're never automatically regarded, not just automatically uh, regarded as Platonic doctrine. But even this approach, I think, and this is broadly speaking, it still tends to collapse the distinction that I'm so keen on, which is the distinction between Plato the writer and his character Socrates. And it does so uh, by treating Socrates as a kind of uh, superhero. Superhero, what do I mean by that? Well, this Socrates is imagined to be uh, a, co a conversational strategist of such amazing ability, such, such cunning, such foresight, you can't wrong foot, it, foot him, and so on, uh, that the kind of control that he can exercise over a live discussion, a live argument within the fiction, of course, is the equivalent to the kind of control that his author Plato achieved when he was sitting alone in his study writing the whole thing and I call this, this isn't the mouthpiece approach to Socrates, I call this the secret agent. Socrates' secret agent approach. So Socrates behaves as if he were Plato's undercover operative within the dialogue, manipulating the conversation on Plato's behalf and knowing everything his author knows. Knowing everything that his author knows. 
And there I just, and, and my approach differs in a way that I'm going to give you an extended example now uh, so as to illustrate. But let me just say, before I turn to that, that uh, let me just acknowledge, uh, there's no denying, you know, for this Socrates as superheroic, uh, as, as a guy with super superhero powers when it comes to argument, there isn't any denying that Socrates in the dialogues that you're reading uh, has a certain Sherlock Holmes quality to him. You know, he is pretty astounding. Um, it, it's, it's even more like, uh, for those of you who, if there are any fans of vintage television or for those with longer uh, memories, a certain Columbo quality. There's a detective show called Columbo. And it's a better example because Columbo always wears a dirty raincoat. And uh, Socrates is famously disheveled and doesn't care at all about his, his clothing. But they have the same kind of, let me just ask, I can't do the New York accent, but let me just ask one little question more, says Columbo on his way out, just when the, uh, the victim thinks he's got, getting off scot-free, and then he comes, he's a detective, right? And he, then he comes back and just destroys the guy. Uh, yeah, Socrates does have this uh, quality, but I would urge us all not to be distracted by this uh, quality that Plato gives him, not to distract us from the limitations that are imposed on Socrates, by the need to argue live, which is what is portrayed within the, within the story. And that's what I'm going to emphasize because, and why? Because I think Plato makes hay out of those. He uses those limitations. He makes them salient uh, for the reader. And why? So that he can invite us to overcome them for ourselves. Overcome the limitations under which Socrates, who is arguing live, works Overcome them for ourselves, because we are not arguing live. Plato is not arguing live. Plato is writing for us, and we are reading him. And it's from the reading that we give of Plato that we come to the philosophic understanding that Plato wants to get across to us, such philosophic understanding as he can get across uh, to us. So what Socrates says and does within the story needs to be supplemented. If we're ever going to get a good guess for ourselves of what Plato is trying, what Plato is trying to say and do. Um, and, and quite apart from playing up the limitations on, what Soc on, on live argument, I think that Plato was alerting his readers uh, more broadly to urging us to supplement what Socrates says and does when he chose to give his dialogues the, uh, the literary razzmatazz that he does. They're really brilliant works of literature. Uh, and th that alerts us to the fact that, look, the voices you're hearing are voices of literary characters, not the voice of Plato. So, uh, and Socrates in particular is a convincingly written character. So don't, Plato is warning us, don't treat him as my mouthpiece. He's, my ca he's a character that I wrote. Attend to his voice and then try and listen behind Socrates' voice for my voice, my Plato's voice. That's what I think is going on. And that's what I want to say, that's all I want to say on a general level about how I read a Platonic dialogue. Am I still going in and out on the microphone, trying to talk to the, it's okay now? Good. I do tend to dance around a bit, but I can, uh, there, there is a, a, a Greek phrase where they used to wrap themselves in, um, I think some of you are doing these, this dramatic thing where you're wearing togas or Greek, uh, Greek costume, and uh, uh, if you want to wrap yourself, wrap your right arm tightly so that you can't move it, the Greek orators did exactly that before they spoke. Uh, why? To stop doing all this flapping the hands around that are people like, it, good Italians like me are inclined to do. And so I will try and mm, channel, their, channel their spirit now. Well, so this is a brief presentation, getting longer with every aside that I make, so let me check on time. Uh, but it's, 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 it's not easy for me to explain to you how this process of supplementation works. The best way is if you know, we, we sat down for a long time and went through, uh, you know, for days on end, and went through an entire uh, dialogue at a leisurely pace. Of course, we can't do that. So I picked one of Plato's shorter, shortest dialogues, and, and I picked out particular passages of it for analysis hoping to give you a good enough sense of that, how that dialogue works uh, as a whole. 
And the dialogue I've chosen is called the ion, I-O-N, the ion, uh, like the chemical entity. Uh, and it's no surprise that this dialogue especially should give us insight into how Plato writes, because it's the only dialogue that is the only Platonic dialogue that is wholly devoted to the topic of poetics. The dialogue takes the form of a direct conversation between Socrates and Ion, just like a play, it's a direct drama. And who is Ion? He's a professional rhapsode, that's to say he's an expert uh, in Homer, an expert in Homer. He recited Homer at large gatherings, recited him in dramatic fashion, he acted Homer out. Uh, and he also lectured on Homer, what was in Homer, sort of gave appreciative lectures on Homer, praising Homer. Some rhapsodes, though not Ion, notably not Ion, uh, also extended their range to include poets other than Homer. The dialogue's constructed like a sandwich uh, in between the two slices of bread, uh, which are the two typically Socratic interrogations of Ion that occupy the first and final thirds of the dialogue comes the tastiest part, a, uh, the part with the strongest flavor, which is a rhetorically and poetically high-flown speech, uh, and very untypical of Socrates, uh, that, uh, that Socrates delivers on the subject of poetic inspiration, and that comes in the central third of the dialogue. But let me start with the interrogations and spend some time on the interrogations, because they're gonna give you a good idea of how, to sup how I think Socrates should be supplemented. So the interrogations take aim at what it means to be an expert, what it means to be an expert on Homer. Does being an expert on Homer amount to being an expert, asks Socrates, on the, the topics that, Homer, the, 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 that are there in Homer's poems? But there are many, many topics in Homer's long, too long uh, epics. Some of them are quite technical. For example, uh, we hear at one point in Homer about how to win in a chariot race, how to negotiate the corner in a, in a, in a chariot race so that you don't skid off. Uh, at another point, we hear about well, what goes into a, a pick-me-up beverage, sort of a pick-me-up that you administered to soldiers who were exhausted from battle or even who were wounded uh, in battle. So Socrates asks Ion, well, wouldn't a charioteer be more of an expert on that first topic, you know, how to win in a chariot race, than Ion is? And, and wouldn't a doctor be more of an expert on the second topic of how to, how to mix that, what should go into that pick-me-up? So wouldn't they make better judges than Ion in these cases of how well Homer has dealt with those particular topics? And yet, Ion, you tell me that you're, the, you're telling me that you're the appropriate judge of everything in Homer. Uh, Ion claims that at 539e in, uh, in the dialogue is the reference. But um, so isn't that a problem for you, Ion? Or are you going to say instead that uh, if, uh, if instead of limiting our attention to these technical topics, uh, if we take a much more general view of Homer's topics, which Socrates himself does at one point, uh, then it'd end up including stuff like warfare, life in society, relations between gods and mortals. I think of those topics, we're going to end up, in other words, with some of the most important topics in human life. So, I, so is I on an expert in everything that's most important in human life? I on himself only claimed to be an expert in Homer. So what does it mean to be an expert in Homer? Well, now, yeah, now here let me turn to some supplementation. And I've already, ma I've already made my first <coughs> supplementation. Because Socrates never brings up the larger question that I just brought up of, are you iron on expert on everything that's import most important in human life? Socrates never faces iron directly with that question. I'm the one raising it on Socrates' behalf. I'm doing that. Uh, that grander list of Homer's topics that Socrates does uh, bring up, the only reason Socrates brings that up 
for the needs of his live argument, his live interrogation of uh, Ion, is simply to establish the point that Homer's topics don't substantially differ from the topics of any other Greek poet. Uh, so it's part of an argument aimed at dislodging Ion from his self-satisfaction at being a specialist in Homer and being perfectly happy to remain an amateur when it comes to every other kind of poet. So the fact that I have had to raise the larger question on Socrates' behalf just goes to show the limitations that I was mentioning, those limitations under which Socrates works when he's operating in this inquisitorial mode of his. Uh, Socrates' questions give Ion a thesis for Ion to defend, and the thesis is this. Ion thinks that the fact that he restricts his range only to Homer takes nothing away from his expertise as a rhapsode. And Socrates, what Socrates is doing is extracting, as he always does when he's arguing in this inquisitorial mode, he's extracting concessions from Ion that are going to build up to an argument that gives evidence against Ion's complacency about restricting his range to just uh, Homer. Uh, and he's going to be leaving Ion puzzled for once about his success as a rhapsode, because he is a successful rhapsode. We're told, one of the very first things we're told in this dialogue is that Ion has just come, come back from winning first prize in, in rhapsody at an international festival. So Socrates is full of congratulations, he's very polite, and then proceeds to uh, refuse to allow him to bask in the glory of his victory. Socrates' goal, as it always is, as he tells us in the Apology that you've been reading, uh, what, uh, my, you know, I, I went to the experts, and it turns out that it, what I was doing was uh, showing them up. And that, then that became his mission, to show those who think they know something, that they don't actually know what they think they know. And he's doing that with Ion, same as he does it with other experts, the same as he did it with the politicians, the same as he tells us that he did it with the poets, though Socrates is never put in dialogue with poets about poetry directly, uh, and eventually with uh, craftsmen, too, in the Apology. Now, <clears throat> Ion in this dialogue, his mind is not the sharpest, and you know his, his character is well drawn for us. His mind is not the sharpest, his vanity is absolutely unassailable, uh, and so the impression that Socrates makes on him is only temporary, has to be admitted. And by the end of the dialogue, dial uh, Ion is preening himself uh, as much as he ever did. But that doesn't change the point that what Socrates, the character, is trying to do is disturb Ion's complacency, even if the success is only uh, temporary. So here's my point about supplementation again, just to kind of clinch it for you in this case. If Socrates does not explicitly raise the larger question about whether Ion is an expert in everything that's most important in human life, which of course leads us to the question that are the poets teaching us about what's most important, everything that's most important in human life? That's the deeper, yet deeper background question that it should raise in our mind. But if Socrates doesn't raise it, it's because he didn't need to in the live argument that he's making. He can disturb Ion's complacency. His, his objective, his immediate objective is more limited within the fiction. Uh, so he can achieve that goal based on narrower uh, premises. But it's Plato the writer whom I am trying to commune with. It's Plato the writer who does raise the larger question, even if not explicitly. And he does so by scripting an interrogation built on narrower premises that provide us with materials to raise the larger question ourselves. And and, and not just the materials, but the nudge that should prompt us to raise uh, that uh, larger question. Because as I said, what is the nudge? It's simply that this list, this very grand list of, uh, of topics, it's on your hand at the bottom of the first page there, in section one. Does Homer speak of any other than the very things that all the other poets speak of? Has he not described war for the most part? And the mutual intercourse of men, good and bad, lay and professional, and the ways of the gods in their intercourse with each other and with men, intercourse meaning discourse, right? And happenings in the heavens and in the underworld, and origins of gods and, uh, and heroes. You know, whew. Socrates is just ticking off the topics there, but we can hear that they contain the whole world. So 
So at this point of the dialogue, actually, where that quote comes up, we've just been told that a seer, a diviner, would make the best judge when the single specialized topic of divination crops up in poetry, because the seer is an expert in divination. And now, immediately after that, how does Plato write this? He makes it such that Socrates, in his argument, feels induced by his writer, though he's not in any, he doesn't know, he's, he doesn't know, he's, he's, it's like the Matrix, right? He doesn't know he's a character in a fiction, so he's doing what Plato wants him to do. Socrates is, is somehow inspired to uh, uh, give a list of topics, and therefore confronting, Plato's confronting his reader with a list of topics, um, that is anything but specialized and parochial, unlike divination this one expertise of divination. Uh, and all of this, we're told, is contained in Homer. Ion, we're told, is an expert in Homer. Well, connect the dots. How could we not ask ourselves whether any expert in Homer could be expert in all of this? But the issue isn't explicitly raised in the text, and Socrates, who is intent on making his much more limited argument, moves right on from it. So that's how Plato nudges. That's how I'm saying that Plato nudges us to think for ourselves. And think of what happens if we, if we don't do this. Well then, as so many readers of the Ion have been, we're apt to be frustrated by this dialogue. If we focus only on the arguments that Socrates himself deploys against Ion, we might think, well look, why, this why did Plato bother writing this conversation? And why did he give him this rather vain and not very smart guy, Ion, to talk with. How about, what if we had Socrates talking with Sophocles? Now that'd be a dialogue, wouldn't it? You know, Why, why isn't that the dialogue on poetry that, uh, uh, that, 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 that Plato uh, wrote? And why must Socrates fasten only on, over and over again, on, these, on things like divination and chariot driving and, 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 and the mixing, you know, mixing your cocktail pick-me-up and whatever? Uh, of course Ion doesn't have those uh, skills. It's an, it's an easy way for Socrates to put Ion in a quandary, but is it too easy a way? Uh, we want to say that, look, Homer isn't even trying. Look, Socrates, Homer isn't even trying to teach us how to race a chariot or mix a pick-me-up. Only, Homer's only trying to tell a story in which these activities feature. And the right question to ask about these activities is how they further the activity of the story. We might want to protest. But that's exactly why I'm urging you to think that that's exactly why it pays not to avoid this frustration and to see how Plato is really writing and what he really wants to do, why it pays not to focus only on the arguments that Socrates makes. In, in, uh, we should focus instead on the limited scope and targeted purpose of those arguments and supplement them for ourselves taking the run of Plato's story as our guide. So, now I'm going to turn to the end of the Ion, the end of the story, where the discussion is allowed to f founder, collapse, over Ion's insistence that he's learned the craft, he knows how to be a general. And he learned that uh, from Homer. And if we turn to that, a deeper point is going to emerge about poetics than Socrates' rather narrow line of questioning seemed to promise. And um, this, is, uh, this is in um, section two. The text that I'll be dealing with and won't be reading all of is section two of your, of your handout. So, well, for, the whole of this, for the whole of the Ion, throughout the dialogue, Ion's been perfectly willing to concede that you know, actually, a charioteer would know better than me how to win a chariot race. A doctor would know better than me how to deliver a reviving uh, a drug to someone. But at last, there comes a moment where he digs his heels in, and that's here towards the end of the dialogue. And Socrates has given Ion a string of questions, uh, which are in the text on the handout, a string of questions that challenge Ion's claim uh, that the rhapsode will know uh, the sort of thing. Yeah, uh, this, isn't in, this is what introduces this uh, stuff in part two. Uh, Ion claimed to know, this is at 540b, if anyone has the dialogue in front of them, 540b, 
Quote, what sort of thing is appropriate for a man to say and for a woman to say, as well as for a slave and for a free person to say, or a subject and a ruler, unquote. Now, why would I suppose that his expertise in Homer, reading Homer, is given in this kind of knowledge? Well, think about it. Imagine he's asked, uh, what sort of thing is appropriate for a woman to say, Ion? He could say, oh, I have a wonderful quote to show you that, to show you what sort of thing is appropriate for a woman to say, and out he trots with, say, the tender farewell that Andromache, the wife of Hector, gives to Hector when he has to go back into the uh, battlefield, or he could give some choice lines from Penelope, the faithful wife of Odysseus, waiting for Odysseus uh, at home and so on. There are women that knew, you know, and then he could, he could uh, close by saying, that's, that's what a woman should say, that's, for, that's how a, a good woman should speak. Uh, now, to respond to that, uh, Socrates, again, is relentlessly inquisitorial, and he comes back by focusing on technical skills. Frustratingly for us, if we think that, if we're just trying to evaluate how good an argument is Socrates making here, then we could just going to end up thinking, Socrates is making a lousy argument here. But if we don't do that, so, let me show you what, what else can happen if we decide not to do that. So, this is Socrates now. You're telling me, Ion, that you've learned from Homer what is appropriate for a ruler or a slave to say. But surely now a ship's captain, who is in effect the ruler of a ship, wouldn't he know better what's appropriate to say when a ship is caught in a storm? Wouldn't he know better than you would? And what about a slave whose job was tending cows, herding cows? Wouldn't he know better than you what to say? Because Ion's claim is, I'd know better what to say. I'd know, sorry, I'd know what these people should say. Wouldn't the uh, cow herder, the slave who's a cow herder, because you told me you'd know what's appropriate for a slave to say, imagine a slave who's a cow herder, so Socrates is bringing back these mundane technical skills again. Wouldn't he know better than you what to say to a herd of restive cows so as to calm them? And Ion says, well, yeah, I guess so. I've got to concede that you, when you put it that way, Socrates, seems right, because Ion's not willing to actually put up a lot of fight here. He allows Socrates to lead him on. But then, finally, Socrates brings up the case of a war leader exhorting his troops. And here, Ion has got a surprise for Socrates. Um, so it's at, uh, it's at the very end uh, of section two, uh, the last four lines. Uh, Will the rhapsode know what a man should say when he is a general exhorting his men? Yes! That's the sort of thing a rhapsode will know. Well, but... Is the art of the rhapsode, Socrates seems a bit nonplussed, is the art of the rhapsode the art of the general? And I on, well, I at any rate would know what a general ought to say. It's a very careful answer. Socrates, you weren't asking me whether I know what a, what, how to be a general. You were asking me, would I know what a general should say when he's a general exhorting his men, giving a speech of encouragement to his men? Well, Yes, I at any rate would know what a general ought to say. Nice careful answer from Ion, uh, which is unusual for him, and I think that's Plato's hint to us that, reader, wake up here and notice how carefully Ion answered, and therefore notice that this is the nub uh, of the issue, uh, of at, or at least one nub of the issue that I'm getting across to you. So the assumption behind Socrates' surprise response is this, that a person who knows what is appropriate for a general to say when exhorting his troops uh, would be someone who knows what to say because he has the skill of, of a general. He's a good general. That's what would qualify him to know what to say. And Ion therefore gives a, a careful reply, well, I know what he should say, whether or not I'm a general. And that is the issue, because look, you can know, the issue is this, you can know what sorts of things an expert would say for two different, very, very different reasons. One is because you possess the actual expertise. You're an expert, and so you know what an expert should say in situations involving your expertise. Alternatively, you can appear, you can and merely appear, to possess the expertise because you know what sorts of things an expert would say. Now, with skills like herding cows or steering a ship, the expertise clearly involves more than just talk. You wouldn't last five seconds if all you could do was talk the talk. 
and you're trying to run a ship or, or herd restive cows. Uh, but with other jobs, the situation is less clear. Uh, now, Athenian generals, it's true, uh, like Homeric commanders, they did see action on the battlefield, but uh, in, um, sometimes they were primarily political, political leaders. And uh, there was a political and strategic aspect to the general's skill. Pericles was a general, and we think of him as more of a, uh, of a politician. Uh, and, and what's more, Socrates' original question was, would you know what a general would say when exhorting his troops, when giving a speech uh, to his troops? And Homer's Iliad is full of speeches like that. So I could just trot out, well, I know what Homer would say. Homer's given me the words, right? Ain't that good enough? I could give a great speech to my troops and then send them out uh, to do battle. Now, in the remainder of the dialogue, Socrates does then proceed to demolish Ion's, uh, the idea that Ion's knowledge of Homer could actually make him a good uh, general, if only Athens had the sense to, to make use of his services in that regard. But uh, Ion does, uh, you know, those arguments don't bring up the nub of the issue directly, as so often with Socrates. But it becomes clear when Ion fights back for a while, before giving up at the end, uh, that Ion is willing to entertain the thought, anyway, that being a good general amounts to nothing more than knowing what to say in wartime, and that Homer provides the best models of what to say and what not to say. Uh, an assumption that, Ion, that Socrates does not directly uh, attack but that the action of the dialogue raises for us as what Plato, as part of what Plato is attacking. And here there's something you should know about uh, Athenian culture at the time. Uh, if we think back to the list of those grand topics that Homer shares with other poets, we remember that it includes um, the social intercourse that human beings and gods engage in, uh, and in the same way that a general would know what to say in wartime, because he's an expert war leader, a person who's been properly acculturated, uh, has developed a sense of social propriety, knows the mores of his society, would know, more broadly, what is appropriate for a man or a woman to say, a free person or a slave, a ruler or a subject, what they should say in their dealings with each other in society, in their personal dealings with each other. Um, but when Ion claims to have learnt this kind of thing from Homer, uh, by virtue of being a, a rhapsode, rather than from his own upbringing and acculturation, he seems to mean no more than that Homer has given him the words to say. And unfortunately, you can go pretty far in life, uh, as Ion has, knowing only what to say, knowing only what to say, rather than thinking hard about how to live. You can think of political examples for yourself at this point. But back to that point about cultural practice in Athens uh, that I was uh, alluding to. There was a kind of a cottage industry at work uh, compiling collections of maxims and of you know, choice points in, in, in speeches and passages from the poets on the assumption that they could provide us with advice for living. Uh, you know, tell us, tell us how to live. These uh, Christomathies, they're called. Uh, learning of noble thoughts, Christomathies. And, uh, and I take it that Plato's immediate target here is the assumption behind the compiling of such collections. The more distant target being uh, the idea that Ion seems willing to entertain, that knowing how to live is a matter of knowing how to speak. Plato's attacking both of those things. And how does he do it in the action of the story? He has had Socrates basically take those compilers of Christomathies at their word. He's taking them at their word, and he pushes their assumption to absurd lengths. To absurd lengths. In this way. In effect, Socrates is saying, well, look, if we can learn from Homer how to live, can we also learn from him how to win a chariot race? If not, why not? Because, is it, would it be because knowing how to live unlike knowing how to win a chariot race, is a matter of knowing how to speak? Is that why you, uh, why, why you would uh, say that he can teach us how to live? Really? That's what you think? Knowing how to live is a matter of knowing uh, how to speak? So Socrates is 
pushing it towards that, que that, that, that question, but never actually openly uh, discussing it because he doesn't need to. And it's Plato who is raising it for us. Okay. Now I want to move on to the meat in the sandwich. Or the tofu in the sandwich, whatever. Equal, equal opportunity dietitian here. So this uh, same uh, strategy of taking, uh, taking your target at its word and pushing it towards absurdity, it also governs Socrates' speech about uh, poetic inspiration that, as I told you, it comes in the central portion of the dialogue. Now, the speech itself is very poetic in tone. It begins with an extended simile that wouldn't seem out of place uh, in Homer. Socrates describes inspiration. He makes a comparison with a magnet or with magnetic force. Uh, inspiration is there's a magnetic current that derives from the poetic muse, and it's transmitted by the poets to those who perform their... Uh... Now, I mustn't put stuff up on the blackboard and talk, or the microphone will disappear, so I'll stay here. Though a picture would have been nice. Uh, so you've got the muse, who is like the, magneti the, the magnetic rock, uh, and the muse magnetizes first the poets, who are going to perform, who are going to, so that they can write poetry. And then the poets magnetize people like Ion, who actually recite uh, this poetry. And Ion, by his dramatic recitation, uh, is, channels the magnetic current of inspiration to its final uh, destination, which is the audience listening to him. It's like the stunt, Socrates says, where a long chain of metal rings and other metal objects are hanging, are made to hang from the magnetic uh, stone. So it goes muse, poets, performers, audience, in that order. And they all share in this inspiration in their own way, or with the muse as the cause of it. And, and then here's the remarkable thing that Socrates says. Well, look at that chain of uh, poets, performers, and audience. None of them is in their right minds. None of them is in their right minds while they are under the influence of the muse. They're out of their mind. And he starts with the poets. Just look at how they describe themselves in their own poems. You know, they tell us they can fly around in the air like honeybees, uh, bringing us uh, songs from springs flowing with honey. This is uh, number three uh, on the handout. And then he continues about half the way down the handout. And what they tell is true. You know, what they tell about flying around like honeybees. It's true. For a poet is an, I prefer the translation airy here. The poet is an airy and winged and sacred thing and is unable ever to indict, to compose poetry, until he has been inspired and put out of his senses and his mind is no longer in him. So, Socrates, as I think you can see, is making his point here by taking poets at their word. You know, what they say is true. And I don't mean he's taking the metaphors literally. In fact, he makes it quite clear that it's their souls, it's poets' souls that do the flitting around uh, like, uh, and, and the honey gathering. They don't actually perform miracles. Uh, so, so Socrates could have taken these metaphors in a positive direction, notice. Uh, he could have pointed out that the process of poetic composition really is a bit miraculous, uh, even if it's only poet souls that take flight. Because no poet or storyteller ever made their poems come alive uh, by mechanically applying rules. Something less readily definable is at work with good uh, poetry. Uh, it, to compose a good poem or a good story, uh, and poets is a catch-all term for writers of literature here, by the way, uh, in the Greek context. So to compose a poem or a story is, or it ought to be, to launch yourself on an, ad on an adventure into the unknown. But Socrates doesn't want to take it in that direction because it wouldn't have suited his argumentative inquisitorial purposes, this purpose of unsettling Ion, uh, making Ion less cocksure about his own uh, talent. So, <clears throat> 
So the moral instead that he draws from the poet's traditional claim to be inspired is that they don't in fact have an expertise or art, even though they also claim that they do. And so he pushes the poet's metaphors to, to a, a negative and almost absurd direction, all the way to the idea that the poets are downright crazy. Downright crazy. And look again, that's why I wanted the, uh, the translation airy rather than light, for the poet is an airy and winged and sacred thing. Sacred, notice that too. Uh, the word is uh, kufos, kufos in Greek, and it has a range of senses. There's a positive range, uh, light or nimble or svelte, and then there's a negative uh, num number of senses, which I would be, I mean something like, like light, uh, insubstantial, uh, slight, flimsy. Uh, so Socrates, you, you, honeybees gathering honey could have been made an image of purposefulness, purposeful con concentration. Boy, they never stop. They are busy bees. Instead, he makes, the, he makes it like they've got a jerky course from one flower to another, and makes, he makes it seem untethered from reality, scatterbrained. And so he's deliberately putting a perverse coloration uh, on, uh, on the, the traditional poetic claim to inspiration, uh, which isn't very fair, actually, because no Greek poet actually claimed to be crazy or out of their minds when they were inspired. When Hobart says, sing in me muse, uh, that's, uh, you know, I want the muse to come down and help me now, help me remember, uh, what he's actually doing is making a claim to authority. Uh, he means, I, as a, as a practicing poet, have memorized all of this, and that's the muse speaking within me. Uh, okay, that's so much for the poets. I should move on to the second link and uh, wind up. Uh, the second link in the chain is the performers. And again, Socrates is maintaining a strategy of taking people at their word in order to turn their own words against them. So he interrupts his speech at one point to ask Ion how Ion feels when he's performing an especially exciting or especially poignant scene. This is number four on the handout especially exciting or especially poignant scene in Homer. Uh, Ion, don't you seem to be right there in the thick of the action? As if the action is unfolding all around you when you're really getting into your acting performance. And uh, halfway down, sorry, there's some repetition. The handout didn't print quite right. My fault. Uh, but in the middle there, Ion says, uh, uh, yes, um, don't you... Yes, don't you feel that, uh, well, end of the first paragraph. Does your soul in ecstasy suppose uh, herself to be among the scenes you are describing, whether they be in Ithaca or in Troy, or as the poets may, po poems may chance to place them? Then skip a bit, and Ion says, How vivid to me, Socrates, is this part of your proof? For I will tell you without reserve. When I relate a tale of woe, my eyes are filled with tears. And when it is of fear or awe, my hair stands on end with terror and my heart leaps. Now, Socrates is ready to pounce. That's the thing that Socrates is going to pounce on and push to absurdity. And what he says is, look, here you are, dressed in a wonderful, magnificent robes, the traditional uniform of the rhapsode. You're wearing a crown of gold. Uh, you're surrounded by well-wishers in their thousands who are loving what you're doing. It's a festival time. Everyone's happy. You're in no danger of being robbed of your finery, you're in no danger of being harmed in any way, and here you are with your eyes filling with tears and your heart beating like you're afraid. What, uh, and you say you're in your right mind? Is that reasonable behavior? And Ion can only admit that, well, when you put it, once again, when you put it like that, Socrates, it really does seem rather strange. So once again, Socrates is taking a genuine and rather wonderful uh, uh, phenomenon in a direction that makes it seem merely uh, bizarre. Uh, yes, if we were looking at Ion's behavior like a Martian would, purely from the outside, uh, and we see that he's showing symptoms of fear and, and distress in a situation that offers him no apparent uh, distress, but of course you wouldn't see that they're, a pro as we would say, a product of Ion's uh, imagination. Nevertheless, Ion's, it's genuine. You know, Ion's, eyes really, Ion's eyes really do fill with tears. The hairs on, a, on the back of his neck really do uh, bristle. And one wants to protest, that isn't a silly thing, it's an amazing thing. Plato's raising that for us. Socrates doesn't explicitly uh, raise that. 
Uh, finally, the audience, the third link in the chain, well, that's simpler. The sense in which they too aren't in their right minds is, the same as for, is much the same as for Ion. Ion's a great actor. He's good at transmitting his emotions to the audience. And so they too, will, their eyes will fill with tears and the hair at the back of their neck uh, will bristle, though they're as safe and sound in their, in their seats uh, as, as, Ion, as, as Ion is. So I want to finally look again at those three links in the chain more explicitly from Plato's standpoint to clinch my point. Uh, so uh, when Socrates has, complete, has concluded his speech about inspired uh, poets, he asks Ion, don't I seem to you to be telling the truth? And here's how Plato has Ion respond. This isn't on your handout. Let me just read it, a translation to you. Quote, by God you do, or so I think. For you touch me somehow with your words, Socrates. You touch me in my soul. And now I believe that it's by divine dispensation that good poets transmit these things to us from the gods. So Socrates has used many of the devices of poetry in his speech. And the poetry has obviously enchanted his listener. Ion has been bowled over. And what this moment in the action amounts to is an acknowledgement by Plato, because Socrates doesn't pay any attention to the emotion in Ion's response. He moves right on, just uses it. Uh, but what Plato is doing, Plato the writer, is acknowledging the power that poetry and high flow and rhetoric, such as Socrates has employed, the power that it has to captivate us, and by captivating us to convince us, Ion says, and now I believe that it is by divine dispensation that blah, 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 blah. It's an acknowledgement by Plato, not by Socrates. And Plato's acknowledgement is, is positive in the sense that it does justice to poetry's power and it registers its strangeness in an admiring rather than a dismissive way. Because look what it's done for Socrates' argument, after all. It's moved it right along. But, and here's another important point I need to make. And sorry, I'm going a little bit, a few minutes over time. And if you need to walk out, I will, it, perfectly fine. I quite, I, quite, I quite understand. I've used up my time but I will uh, go on a bit. Uh, having been condemned to death, I will now say a few more words to those of you who are, uh, who are willing to, uh, to, <laughs> to stay, an allusion to the apology. Uh, Plato's acknowledgement of the positive power of po poetry also contains a warning. I think this admiration of his that he expresses is rueful. Why? What, what tells me that that's going on in Plato's mind? I, you know, I can't just phone him up. I wish I could. Uh, well, actually, I don't wish I could because I prefer doing this work for myself. Uh, but what tells me uh, that that's what's going on in his mind is the action of the argument. Uh, the argument of the action, rather. Sorry. <laughs> Reverse that. Ion has just lapped up the flattering notion that poets, though they're merely human, are in close contact with the divine. But he's conveniently failed to register the consequence of finding that idea delightful, which is that these poets are possessed, even crazy. Uh, their achievement isn't then the result of any expertise of their own. And that's going to come back to bite him when Socrates extends that point, consequent right down the length of the chain, where Ion also uh, finds himself. So if you're crazy, can you be thoughtful? Can a captivated audience be a thoughtful audience? This, again, is another nub of the issue. Can a captivated audience be a thoughtful audience? Uh, that's the issue that Plato is raising for his readers. And as we'll see in a very short moment, the implicit argument, uh, answer that his dialogue gives to that is, it depends. Can a captive audience be a thoughtful audience? Answer from Plato, it depends. Uh, in other words, if you're reading the poets, mm, if you're reading me, Plato the poet, maybe it's going to be OK. And let me just explain to you why it might be OK when the poetry we're reading is Plato's, because this is poetry, it's a fictional dialogue. It's literature, it's a story. Uh, so the problem for the, let me see, I really do want to cut this a bit short for you. Uh, yes. So Ion deserves credit for his performance skills and Plato gives him his due. But the acknowledgement comes with a warning. The onus is on Ion, another warning, as a professional, to maintain. So Ion is able to concentrate on the audience. There's a bit in the dialogue where he says, 
uh, I need to uh, keep my eye on them while I'm performing, because if I can keep my eye on them while I'm performing, even though my eyes do fill with uh, tears, uh, if I notice that I'm really gripping them, uh, you know, here am I standing behind a microphone, making my eyes move over uh, the audience as I've been, I've been told to do so that I can register how much, uh, how much I'm getting through to you. I is doing the same thing. That doesn't mean that the sweat isn't trickling down the back of my shirt right now, right? I mean, I'm genuinely engaged. The emotion is there. Same thing with any, uh, same thing with any performer. Uh, it doesn't take away from the genuineness of Ion's involvement with the action that he is uh, keeping a careful eye on the audience and trying to make them genuinely uh, involved. But for the audience, who also then he gets inspired in this way, they have no such burden of responsibility. And all they're feeling is the emotion, maybe on the cheap, maybe not thinking about it, maybe being damaged by it. Ion's actually in a better place. <laughs> than the audience. That's the warning, I think, that Plato, the action of the dialogue, is transmitting uh, for, uh, for us. And this, then, is my final point. How does Plato escape his own strictures on poetry? Plato's iron also is a story. And in this case, it's a story in dramatic form. How does he avoid those dangers of telling, of, of telling a story to an audience? Well, there's one very simple point you can make, which is that the storyline in a platonic dialogue is the progress of a philosophic discussion. So that's a much tamer matter. You've got to be a certain sort of person to want to open a book, uh, open a story that, you know, that is, uh, whose content is a philosophic discussion. You know, if you're going to go to a movie like My Dinner with Andre, instead of, uh, instead of uh, which is just one educated conversation around a dinner table, uh, uh, the action of the movie, rather than Star Wars or something, uh, then that's going to attract a more thoughtful kind of person. Plato could well have uh, thought to himself. But I think we should admit to ourselves that Plato can't completely avoid the dangers and doesn't expect to completely avoid the dangers. Uh, the Ion is a comic dialogue, and its comedy is really quite funny. Uh, with Socrates' speech on inspiration, the Ion becomes a poetic dialogue, and its poetry is really quite memorable. Now, for many a reader of the Ion, that's enough. And so be it, says Plato to himself. The real points that Plato wants to make about the dangers of poetry in this dialogue, dangers that are themselves at the same time like a testimonial to poetry's remarkable power, they're points that Plato, the writer, shows us, not points that Socrates' his character tells us. Plato, the writer, shows us these points. They're not the points that Socrates, the character, tells us. And that being the case, Plato is at the same time able to make what is perhaps his most important point about poetry, which it turns out is a point in poetry's favor. Please note, a point in poetry's favor, which is this, as I read what Plato is trying to get across to us in the Ion. From poetry, from literature, we can learn without being told. From poetry, from literature, we can learn without being told. We can learn for ourselves by seeing what is shown. And in the ion, what we learn about is poetry itself. But it takes a thoughtful reader to see what is shown, because before we can even can see what is shown, we have to see that something is being shown. We have to see that something is being shown, shown rather than told. And not everyone does see this. The mouthpiece theorists don't see this. So be it. Plato write, is writing then in a way that gives some pleasure and does no harm to those who don't or can't see what is shown, while doing good to those who can. Thanks very much and thanks for your patience. Thank you very much, Professor Ferrari. Okay. Would you say that your argument is that, um, sorry, <laughs> Plato, Plato doesn't use Socrates' ideas, he is using Socrates just as a character and no elements of Socrates' ideas are present in his argument? Yes, sorry, I'm just making little notes for myself. I want to 
remember all these uh, questions. Uh, so is it that Plato doesn't need, doesn't believe Socrates' ideas or words to that effect, right? Yeah, that's a very important question. Thank you for raising it. Uh, no, my position is, com is um, fully compatible with the thought that Plato uh, also uh, believes what Socrates is saying, thinks that what Socrates is saying is, is, is valid, uh, it looks instead to the limitations of that va sound uh, thing that Socrates is saying. So um, uh, that, that um, uh, so for example, uh, it, but but it can also it can also be that Plato doesn't. Uh, Socrates can say things that Plato wouldn't endorse, as well as things that Plato would, because Socrates can use. Um, provocative, uh, provocative arguments that his opponent doesn't succeed in responding to. And Socrates himself, as a character, can perfectly well know that he's exaggerating. So when Socrates says, look, these poets say they're crazy, what about that, Ion? It doesn't mean that Socrates himself has to believe uh, that, poets are, that poets are crazy. Um, Socrates is just, especially in the inquisitorial parts, uh, Socrates is uh, proposing, uh, is, is simply asking questions a lot of the time, so not making uh, statements anyway. Uh, and it, it, it's just, uh, it's compatible with both ideas. We, we have to, with both thoughts, that uh, sometimes Socrates is saying things that uh, really we shouldn't uh, say that poets are crazy. So let's say that this is what Plato believes. Um, I, Plato, believe that, no, it's not that poets are actually crazy and out of their minds, but th there is something undefinable going on. Uh, there is something, inspiration is referring to something real in the world that is more than simply the application of, uh, you know, what you, uh, what you learned in your uh, writing, getting your write, a degree in, written art, in, in writing, you know, in, in post-grad writing programs and so on. Uh, you, there's no formula uh, that you can learn. Uh, and... If Socrates is even wanting to uh, allude to that, and Ion just doesn't get it, or if Socrates is uh, wanting to simply uh, unsettle Ion and therefore doesn't have to uh, draw out that consequence, then uh, that, that doesn't matter. What matters is that uh, then it's perfectly okay for Socrates because we acknowledge his limited purpose. Yeah. Uh, so, um, but a lot of the time, I mean, think, I think most of the time, uh, especially in a dialogue like the Republic, Plato is going along with what Socrates is saying, but he's, he keeps on, in the Republic, for example, he keeps on getting him interrupted and diverted from his argument. Uh, and we have to ask, why did he do that? Rather than that he actually disagrees with what Socrates says about justice in the city. Uh, uh, so I don't think uh, Plato is, I, I don't want to ironize Socrates, or Socrates, I certainly don't want to say that Socrates means, doesn't mean what he's saying and neither does Plato. So for example, when, so, so when it comes to the Republic, I believe that Plato thought the ideal city in the Republic was uh, an ideal city as cities go. Unfortunately, you know, unfortunately we have to live in cities, we have to live in societies. It'd be better if we could live in small communities of philosophers, but uh, we can't do that. Uh, but that as cities go, this would be a, a good thing. There are some readers of uh, the Republic that want to say, uh, no, Plato wrote it to show us that, uh, no, this is not, uh, this is really not what we should want for ourselves, uh, even civically, as a, as a way of living. Uh, so I'm perfectly happy with the idea that uh, Plato goes a lot, Plato can believe in what Socrates is saying, but we don't, but my crucial point is that we don't get at what Plato uh, wants to get across to us unless we supplement what Socrates is saying. Um, if he's using fictional dialogue, then why does he use non-fictional people? Why doesn't he also make them themselves fictional so that there's, they have no ideas of their own to like conflict with his? Yeah, another, that's a nice question. Uh, you know, I kept saying Socrates is a fictional character, but he's a character in a, fic he's a, character in a fiction. 
but he's a, he's a guy that really lived. Uh, one thing that's gained by um, one thing that's gained by making Socr by, by using Socrates is uh, and then putting him in fictional situations that show Plato's appreciation uh, of Socrates uh, is that um, this guy really did live. And, you know, he was the most just man that ever lived. And he really did live. <laughs> and that should be encouraging to us. Uh, we can have faith that uh, this guy came to earth <laughs> uh, and was among us. Uh, so I think that's uh, part of it. Another, other parts of it are, you know, there's a lot of Athenian politics going on for Plato's contemporary readers. Uh, that, and acknowledgments that Plato wants to make. Plato, Plato's family was involved in the... Uh, in the in the in the tyranny that uh, the junta that took over Athens and led to terrible terrible suffering, uh, Plato was born with a historical and political uh, legacy, and he may have been working that out. It seems certainly, surely, uh, there's an element of his working that out by using real characters from that time. Things like that is what I, I imagine. John, I'll, I'll call on myself next. Thank you so much for such a thoughtful uh, reflection this afternoon. You spoke at the end about the power of literature to teach by showing, uh, to teach without telling, which I think raises lots of interesting questions for us. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to how you think of the relative value of literary showing versus philosophical telling. Uh, and is that perhaps an argument ultimately in favor of poetry over against philosophy? Yeah. Very important question. Thank you, Raymond. I... Um, I, I think that... I think of Plato as a kind of philosopher who acknowledged that engaging in philosophic argument is how is a large part of how the philosoph philosophic life is, is spent. I mean, that's what you do uh, as a philosopher, but who also thought that you must never let the philosophic telling distract you from or become so involving and become so full of epicycles and complexities and that it you lose touch with the philosophic values, the values that made you a person who wanted to live his life coming up with philosophic arguments in the first place, which, was, which were truth-seeking values, uh, and uh, of truth-seeking values of a kind That could define your entire life, your moral life as well, uh, and, un and, and never become merely um, a hermetically sealed discipline like mathematics is. And that's why mathematics is subsidiary to philosophy and a vision of the form of the good in the Republic, and why I think uh, Plato, in his later dialogues, writes them to remind people in his academy uh, of the values that lie behind philosophic, uh, philosophic telling. But to answer the question you ended up with, which is, is literary showing superior to philosophic telling? I will confess to a, a danger that I think my own practice of reading Plato is susceptible to, which is that I spend most of my time, uh, I feel a bit like, you know, standing to Plato as Ion stands to Homer here now. Uh, I spend most of my time figuring out what Plato is showing us through the literature, through, through his uh, literary writing. But I also believe that 
you know, I've raised things and said, and here's the nub of the issue. And if I were a philosopher who wanted to spend my life in philosophic telling, uh, I would set aside my lecture at that point and said, and now let's discuss it. Let's, let's argue that out about uh, whether it's enough to talk the talk uh, or not, and uh, how many, into how many parts of human life does that ramify, and, um, you know, I'd sit down and write a theory of justice or something, you know, and I don't do that in my professional, uh, in my professional life. So I do think, this is a long-winded way of saying, I do think that Plato is urging us to go out and then learn for ourselves by arguing among ourselves. We don't go out and learn for ourselves by writing literature. So in that sense, I do try to cling to the idea that the writing is preliminary to, well, no, I don't want to devalue literature to that extent. That the writing without, because the literature is doing this hugely important role, playing this hugely important role of confirming us in our values, urging us to values and then hopefully confirming us in those values, uh, which is the very thing that Plato thought most important not to lose touch with. But then, if you just luxuriate, there's a danger of luxuriating in that, which you can do if you spend your time interpreting Plato's dialogues, without ever walking the walk, <laughs> uh, which is in this case, uh, doing philosophy among like-minded uh, the kind of discussions I've been having with you guys, uh, th those, we're not composing literature to each other. <laughs> you know, we're, we're engaging in philosophic argument when we do that. And that is, that is the life. Um, so both components are essential. So I'm, also, so I'm not willing to say uh, literary showing is more important than philosophic telling. I think there are these two components that work together. Uh, that work together for Plato. And I think it is the case, un unfortunately, and this is my most uh, expensive concession that I have to make in this methodology that I'm using. In a way, what emerges, it, makes, it turns the ion, for example, into... It's more like reading a good essay in... in, in in first things or something, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a journal of, 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 of thought or in, or in uh, the new criterion or something like that, that doesn't, although some of those come close to just being scholarly articles, but it, 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 in a, or maybe, maybe even like Vanity Fair, you know, it's, it's more like a, a, a really good essay in, uh, in one of our good magazines. Rather, rather than, is, is what it amounts to, because uh, what I draw out from Plato is not a full philosophic argument. It's really not. The arguments are the ones that Socrates gives, and they're, uh, they're not complete. And you couldn't settle for those. Uh, you shouldn't be... You, you can't settle for arguing that Homer tried... Homer. We should think of Homer as trying to teach us how to win in a chariot race. That's obviously, I think Plato is allowing us to see that that's obviously incomplete, that's obviously inadequate. But that's the only argument that Socrates actually, those are the words that Socrates actually says. Uh, and so I'm in danger. I mean, I can hear my critics now if I ever publish this book. Uh, he turns Plato into a bunch of suggestions. And he turns the, what we've thought of as the philosophy of Plato into things not to, that are, we're on a, we should be, regard ourselves, Plato was urging us not to accept. <laughs> I, I, I feel the danger of that. So that was a long answer to a really important question, though. I think we have time for just one or two more questions. I have Robert. Uh, thank you um, for the talk. Uh, and thank you for writing that book on the Phaedrus. It helped me in a grad student when I was a grad student to write a term paper. So thanks. Oh, great, um, thank you. <laughs> anyway, no, I, I'm just going to ask you 
something, and I want to just see whether or not like it's consistent with what you've been speaking about. Because I was wondering if you could just explore the ways in which the Platonic dialogues are um, practices in uh, pedagogy. So, like in the sense that it's not that you know, it, just to, to play your critics for a second, it's not that you're dismantling what we thought was Plato, or that um, you know everything that's being said in the dialogues is actually just a kind of an illusion, and the real people know the esoteric teaching, and we call them Straussians and stuff. Um, but what I meant is that, um, but it's an act in because you've talked about the development of the. I think what was in, or what I took as sort of implied in your argument was a developmental way of reading it. And I don't mean developmental in a... Understood. Yeah, yeah. In the sense that, like, okay, a freshman reading Plato and then develops a love for Plato for a certain type of reading, and then it develops to, to no longer just the arguments and the language, to the drama, to the showing, so to speak. And I wonder if that development, that... that um, uh, um, that sort of pedagogy is a way of the showing, as you've been describing, is when you're starting to start to think on your own. Yes, thank you. Yeah, that's good. And that's a more positive way that I could have... Uh, uh, I, I, I was sort of lacerating myself a bit in answer to Raymond's question. Uh, um, but... Uh, in answer to Professor Haynes' question. But um, I... Uh, uh, yes, let me not lose touch with the fact that Socrates' arguments are philosophic arguments, and to challenge them in your own mind is already to start thinking philosophically, and, uh, and if you don't then come up with a full philosophical counter-argument of your, your own, just to have the objections raised in your mind is itself something along the lines of, uh, it gives you, along the lines of philosophic telling, because you've, you can exp raise an explicit challenge. And, and that's certainly... Uh, part of it, and, and then there are these higher values that you want to um, develop out of uh, that, uh, those philosophic objections that you've been having come up in your mind as you read. Yes, yes. Uh, so certainly uh, that they are exercises in pedagogy, uh, for sure. There are stages you have to go through to get at the full th um, thing that, the material that Plato wants to get across to you. So thank you for that really cool talk. Um, so my question is, uh, when you were talking about like how your own critics, like they would say that, um, are you like boiling down Plato to just suggestions and like urging like the audience not to accept? So is there any way to avoid these dangers in literature and poet poetry? Um, is there any way that you think Plato would suggest to avoid these dangers, or that you personally would suggest to avoid these dangers? Or are these dangers just inevitable because we are flawed as human beings? Um, it w the danger is just that I'm not going to have neatly separable arguments to present to the philosophy professors and say, now go and write your article challenging premise, premise two or premise one uh, and, and sink your teeth into that. Uh, what I'm offering instead is that, uh, well, we could sit down and have a philosophic discussion ourselves, you and me, uh, about these issues that have been raised. Uh, I don't see anything wrong with that, but I can see how professionally uh, and even in terms of what they think it is to come to terms with Plato as a philosopher. Uh, I'm taking too seriously the idea that, Pla for them, that Plato saw himself with his dialogues. You know, we don't know what went on in his academy, but saw himself with the, in his dialogues as uh, a literary writer. Uh, as, uh, and that leaves a certain kind of specialist in ancient philosophy in modern times with nothing to sink his or her teeth into. I invite all of you to join us
in the reception, in the great room, to continue the conversation. Thank you all so much for being with us this afternoon. And let's thank Professor Ferrari. Thank you very much. Thank you.